Department. Hi, I'm Elizabeth um, and I'm a minister in the Uniting Church of Australia and I'll be talking today about Christ and creation but with a slightly different slant, looking at what Jesus may have had to say about environmental concerns or how we could interpret his words in that way. In the preface to the Green Bible, the editors ask, is God green? Did Jesus have anything to say about the environment? What is my role as a Christian in caring for the earth? These are good questions and ones that Christians ask frequently. What is our role in caring for and protecting the environment? How do Christ and creation fit together in a practical kind of way? There is an extensive biblical tradition that God always remains the owner of the earth. Leviticus 25.23 states that, the land shall not be sold in perpetuity, for the land is mine. With me you are but aliens and tenants. Psalm 24 states in verse 1 that the earth is the Lord's and all that is in it. As responsible stewards of the earth, then, it is given to the human creature in trust to manage faithfully and accountably. The ministry of Jesus, as found in the Synoptic Gospels, shows that Jesus knew and understood this concept very well. He was very aware of the gift from God that the natural world around him was, and he delighted in it. His stories not only portrayed the rural world of Palestine, they outlined the roles of both creature and human being, expressing wonder at the magnitude of God's gift to the use of the earth. Jesus spoke of the role of the earth, which produces by itself, so that the birds of the air can make nests in the shade that it produces. The imagery he used in these stories portrayed, among many things, lilies, birds, sheep, pigs, fish, bushes, vineyards, fig trees, seeds and soil. His words always carry the underlying assumption that God cared for every living creature, even the tiny sparrow. In the world of Jesus, the creation was sacred and God's gift to all. Jesus called his disciples and those that followed him around to be more aware of the world around them. He reminded them that the sun, the moon, the stars, red and cloudy skies, storms, floods and the cycle of the seasons all taught something about the kingdom of heaven. Jesus gives the impression of someone who knew and understood the natural world in which he lived and knew how to interpret its various signs, such as when the weather would be fair or stormy and when one might expect a fig tree to be in fruit. Jesus also saw the environment as a place where he would be closer to God. On many occasions, he withdraws to the wilderness areas of gardens or mountains to pray. On one mountain, the transfiguration took place, and on another, Jesus was revealed to his disciples as the Messiah. It is clear that for Jesus, the natural world around him was a place where the divine could enter into the mundane and the thoughts of God could be revealed. Jesus' parables present a picture of thriving natural systems that human beings are part of and who work harmoniously within them. There is an implicit recognition that human beings have more power over the earth than any other species and have a choice in how they exercise that power. It is clear that Jesus respected his environment and he walked lightly upon it. We could say at this point that as disciples of Jesus, we should just emulate this behaviour and be much more aware of our surroundings and the earth that nurtures us. But Jesus goes further than this and demands much more than mere understanding from us. Living in harmony within the land and greater environment was also a justice issue for Jesus. He knew his people lived in oppression in Roman-occupied Palestine. He also knew that large amounts of arable land in Galilee were owned by wealthy overlords, who drove subsistence farmers into poverty and debt. The desire of the powerful and the wealthy to acquire and to possess land and money affected both the earth and the people who lived on it. Excess consumption of food and goods by the rich was frowned upon, as this meant the poor went without. Waste was seen as a bad thing, with lost sheep and lost coins, no matter how small, were valuable and should be treasured. Sitting squarely in the prophetic tradition, Jesus challenged the powerful, the rich, 
and the religious and political establishments in Jerusalem and Rome. He spoke out against the exploitation of the poor he saw happening all around him. Through his nature stories and his parables, Jesus set about offering a revolution to establish a new way of living, one that embodied just principles established on the divine characteristics of love and compassion. Rather than seeking to acquire goods or land, Jesus suggested, somewhat radically, that people should just give it away, share it, or stop exploiting it and the people that worked on it. He lived a life where possessing enough to enable one to live with only the basics of life was seen as enough. Jesus' understanding of his environment, his seeking solitude in nature for times of prayer and revelation, and his prophetic critique of society, and his embodiment of God's compassion, love and justice, can and should lead us to good questions about ecology and faith. First and foremost, we are called to delight in God's good creation and to express wonder for its beauty and how it points to God and the kingdom of heaven. We need to understand creation is a sacred thing, that it nurtures our bodies, our spirits and our minds and that it relates us to life itself as being sacred. As Jesus shows us, places in nature can put us in touch with ourselves and with God transforming our minds and souls. Such places hopefully will evoke in us a sense of wonder for creation and how we connect with it. Carson and Kelsch write how a sense of wonder when connecting with place is the thing that causes us to pause and think before engaging in activities that may harm nature. The places that inspire this sense of awe are frequently natural places and create and maintain a sense of connectedness to creation, where they, which they posit should in turn lead to that creation being treated with respect and care. Secondly, we are called to understand our surroundings, to respect our earth and the plant and animal life upon it, and not exploit it but use it wisely. We need to understand where and how our food is grown and who and what this affects. We must remember that all living creatures belong to the Creator God, a point the Psalms make, and that both animals and humans are saved. In Psalm 36 we read, Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains, your judgments are like the great deep, you save humans and animals alike, O Lord. Psalm 50 states that, For every wild animal of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills, I know all the birds of the air and all that moves in the field is mine. Of course, one could make the argument that the creatures are valued by God only as they are useful to the continuing existence of the human being, though this argument is stretched by the concept that God knows and saves animals, distinctly religious terms relating to the relationship between God and creation. However, any doubt about the validity of an alternative paradigm where humanity sits equally alongside everything else, is dispelled by Psalm 104 in the book of Job. Psalm 104 is one of the Bible's great creation hymns. Its content appears to be related to the speeches of God at the end of the book of Job, and both stand as important religious reminders of the interrelatedness and wonder of creation at a time when we face continued environmental degradation. The teachings of Jesus that refer to the natural order, to the birds and animals of the earth, assume the worldview that is reflected in this great psalm. Psalm 104 challenges a human-centric attitude towards creation. It makes it very clear that all creation is not only dependent on God, but many parts of it are dependent on each other. God holds it all in balance, and each of the component parts interact in necessary ways. Some would say it is a poetic way of describing an ecosystem. God gives all creatures life and breath, and God orders animal and human life in ways that benefit all. Thirdly, we need to be aware of the signs of the times in terms of things like changing weather patterns in view of climate change. Like the Pharisees who could read the weather but failed to grasp the big picture, we too are failing to respond to the big picture crisis of climate change a crisis that threatens not only humanity's existence, but the existence of much of the life on this planet. We subject our planet, 
the only home we have, to being polluted and exploited, to extremes of temperature and weather and deforestation. Species extinction will be around 30% by 2050 and 50% by the end of the decade. This leads us to Jesus' injunctions to free the oppressed and to take up the cause of the poor and the voiceless. It is a sad truth that in our modern civilised world, we continue to oppress the poor through intensive farming practices. We have allowed synthetic created chemicals to poison our air and waterways. We have driven indigenous people off their land to satisfy large corporations requiring huge monocrops. And with the change of the climate of our planet, we threaten the homelands of many, human and animal alike. Greed has enabled giant business corporations to turn food into an industry that threatens the home of all and the holdings of small primary producers and the health of many nations. Every decision we make carries a price and that price is often carried by the people whose lives are affected by our actions. Every decision we make is an ethical one which forces us to choose whether we will act out of love or end up denying the image of God in others, says Julie Clawson in Everyday Justice. Jesus urges us, his followers, to make moral choices based on what is fair, just and righteous. Jesus does not tell us that anything we think or any opinion we hold is acceptable. To act justly means to tackle things like climate change and environmental issues, as these are issues of social justice that affect our poor neighbours. Much of the world's poverty is linked inextricably with environmental issues, and one cannot be dealt with without the other. There is no point finding sacred spaces ourselves when we either ignore or are ignorant of the fact that others' sacred spaces are being exploited. How we live our lives affects the lifestyle and well-being of many others, human and animal alike. As Joanna Macy points out, it is hard to function in our society without reinforcing the very conditions we decry and the sense of guilt that ensures makes those conditions and our outrage over them harder to face. Fourthly, Jesus reminds us that the kingdom of God is a kingdom also on the earth and it is where God's will should be done. Surely this means that Christians should view the earth as far more than just an exploitable natural resource and commodity. We should view its peoples as far more than just cheap and replaceable labour. We should be responsive to the needs of the earth and all of its creatures. We should engage in practices that treat the earth as sacred and consider how we relate to our place within creation and what, we are, and what are the responsibilities we have for this. We need to remember as a part of his serving God and world, Jesus emptied himself. To live the way of God's kingdom was to have no desire to dominate either people or the creation. Fifthly, we need to deal with the question of consumption and who this injures. We need to think of the waste and pollution we generate in the first world and who and what this hurts. Instead of a vision of God's kingdom, sadly, in the Western world, we live a life more enthralled to a vision of acquiring things. Hammer describes our age as one of a psychic enchantment with the products of our industrialised and technologised age, where consumerism exerts a mythic power over us. Our vision has become one of acquisitiveness, of comfort, convenience and control, without, without ever thinking of the ecological consequences. We have lost our connection to the natural systems that are necessary to sustain us. The way of Jesus offers an alternative to this psychic enchantment with acquiring stuff. He offers us a different narrative and a new vision of what it might be like to live a life as a functional part of nature than a destructive force outside of it. While we need to take into account our technological age and the immense culture shifts that have taken place, Jesus impels us to ask ourselves what are wants and what are necessities. Lastly, discipleship is not a passive thing. Jesus calls us to live differently to the oppressive and unjust systems of the world around us. Jesus expected his disciples to live according to the revolutionary values of the kingdom of God. Surely he expects no less of us today. Sadly, we rarely see this kingdom of justice being enacted in the church today. Caring for the environment, 
taking time to cultivate a sense of wonder